Hey y'all, I'm James Wright and welcome to my shop. Today we're making two chisel handles, one of them a socket without a lathe and the other one a tang without a ferrule. Let's dive in. So today we're going to start off with walnut that actually looks like white oak. Okay, it's actually white oak because this is wood by Wright. We're going to start with a block that I want to make an, about an inch and a quarter by about an inch and a quarter. Uh, this is a rough size that I'm going to be whittling down in the future, but I want it to be roughly square so that I can make it an octagon in the future. So we're going to measure out with the marking gauge after squaring up two sides to keep those at 90 degrees. We're going to mark all the way around it and then cut off that piece and then repeat the process with the other side so that we end up with a block that is the appropriate size. Uh, it's easiest to plane two sides cut one side, plane that one, and then cut the last one, and then plane that one, rather than doing them all at one time or trying to mark off multiple sides at one time. Uh, do them one at a time, it just becomes a little bit easier. So we're gonna rip this down, and then we are left with a stock that is square. And that will get us uh, most of the way there, except for I want this to be oct. That is a shape that is very comfortable, as well as there's a lot of history with that in mortising chisels. So once we have a square block, now we need to figure out uh, how do we turn this into an octagon. There's a bunch of different geometric ways. My favorite is just to create a circle on the outside that the circle just touches the outside. And then I plane it down until I just touch that circle. And if you're doing it at 45 degrees, that's going to give you an octagon, which is basically a circle with eight sides. <laughs> so I'm going to do one side and then I'm going to rotate it 180 and do the other side and then that makes it much easier to do the last two rather than doing them in sequential order around the block. The other thing I need to figure out is then how deep will the, uh, the, the, the tang of the wood be to go into the socket. And so I need this to be uh, about an eighth inch to a quarter inch longer than the actual depth of the socket we're working with here. We want to leave a little bit of a shoulder work on this so that it can slide in a little bit deeper in the future uh, as the wood shrinks as it dries. So I'm going to measure what the inside diameter of the socket needs to be at the largest point and then I'm going to cut in a shoulder all the way around from this. So I'm going to basically take this down to the largest dimension it needs to be and with good straight grain material and you do want good straight grain material for the handle you can just chisel down to create the tenon here. This tenon will be round and cylindrical but uh, we need to turn it into a cone. Um, this step I actually find very, very, um, very happy because uh, you can get it roughly to shape with the chisel and then you come in with a, with a good rasp and shape it down into something that is roughly circular. And you don't have to be particular here, you just have to get it kind of close. Now I'm going to start at the top and start roughly turning this into a cone. Uh, there's nothing particular about this other than I'm trying to take off even amounts from the same amount of the side. Uh, so that it's roughly where it needs to be. You'll, you'll see that I'm using the word roughly quite a bit here. Once we get that down close to it, I'm going to drive the piece down on there, and you'll see those places where it's been bruised. Those are the spots that need to come back in and remove more material. And then I can put it back on again and see where it's being bruised this time. And then I need to take off material and those spots. I'm not going to hit the spots where it's not bruising. I'm just going to keep working at it until I get it down on there. I can put a, uh, a pair of pliers on it to allow me to rotate it on and off because that's one of the easiest ways to take the handle out of a socket is you just give it a slight rotation and it releases. You can put that bruising on a little farther and eventually you'll notice that I'm coming into a file rather than a rasp because I want to take off a little bit less. I want to make sure I get a really nice fit until it goes all the way down. I want to leave about an eighth inch um, at the edge before it hits the shoulder. That will give you that little bit of work with it. And I'm getting closer and closer to the fit until, Something yeah, that's right about where I want it to be. And you'll notice that you pound it down on there and it's a really solid hit. It won't move off. Now this handle is a little larger than it needs to be for one of this style. So I'm going to mark it roughly about that. And you notice I'm not being very accurate anywhere. The, the actual length of it really doesn't matter. I just want to get it roughly close. The other thing I want to do is I want to taper the octagon down towards the end so it's larger at the back and smaller at the front. So I'm just going to draw where it needs to match up to the socket and then roughly plane it. I don't want to hit the back end, I just want to hit uh, where it's running into that uh, circle that was drawn around there. And then I can come in with the chisel beveled down and then um, pair it back so I get a nice transition into the cone that we made on there. Working with it bevel down is actually a very enjoyable uh, method, and uh, once you once you get used to working with a chisel bevel down, you find that you use it quite a bit. Now I noticed was my chisel was getting a little dull, and so it's quick to just take it over there and sharpen it up, and then we can chamfer the back end of this. Now I could use a plane, but I really enjoy doing these freehand chamfers with a chisel. 
Uh, take your time and just enjoy the process. It works out very well. So there is the socket. Now let's do a tang. And this is a massive, uh, massive <laughs> pig sticker, uh, mortising chisel. And I want to do some work on this. It needs a little bit of work in here, and I actually want to clean up the surface. There are some burrs sticking out that will cause problems when driving it into the wood. So we're just going to clean it up a little bit. I'm not worrying about being perfect. Um, I just want to uh, to get a nice, smoother surface on here. Next thing I do is I'm going to measure out thicknesses and different lengths from the shoulder of the tang. And this will tell me how big I need to make uh, the holes. And I want the holes to be a little bit smaller than the length of the tang. Um, and then I can measure in how deep they need to go. And this will all be stepped in. So I'm gonna start with the biggest bit and then go to a smaller bit and a smaller bit and a smaller bit, and each one going a little farther. So I can measure the tang and how far in will it be, set a mark on there. Uh, there's nothing that has to be terribly accurate on this other than just be cautious at this point. Don't make them any deeper or bigger than they need to be. You can always file them out and make them smaller. So I'm erring on the side of making them too small. You'll also notice I'm leaving the block very large because I'd rather shape this afterwards to match, to match the chisel rather than shaping it beforehand and, oh, I'm out of alignment. The last one going in is a quarter inch bit, and I'm going to round that one in a good bit farther than it needs to be and just uh, give the, the very tip of the tang a place to go rather than splitting in farther. Sure. At this point, we're just going to file things down. You can see I used the rat tail there to kind of smooth out some of the transitions in those steps inside. And then I can drive the tang in there and find out where do I need to go in a little bit farther. And I'll realize that some of those steps, it's really grinding on those uh, very heavily. And so I'm going to take that step in just a little bit farther. And I'm going to work through these um, two or three times to try and get it close to it. I want to leave that shoulder of the chisel about a quarter inch away from the wood itself. So when I really pound it down on there, it'll sink down in. And so a lot of it is going to be um, trying to find out where does that step need to go down a little bit farther, drilling it out a little bit farther. And some of it's going to be uh, just filing those transitions from one to the other. And eventually I'm going to end up with a new, nice smooth transition all the way down. Now some of this work I can do with a chisel, but realize you're always going to be going against the grain because it tapers down towards the bottom. Um, and so the chisel I'm going to use to take out some of the chunks and then I'm going to come back in with a file and really detail them up. And at this point, you can see it's getting very, very close. I'm getting it down to um, almost where I want it to be, but I'm noticing the chisel is ever so slightly out of alignment. Um, and what I what I realized a little later is that the bottom hole was slightly out of alignment. And so I had to come back in with that and chisel it out. Um, and so I'm going way down in there trying to get that last little bit right in line with everything else. In the end, I wasn't able to get perfectly flat to the shoulder, so what I ended up doing was taking it out and then actually planing the shoulder down to make it match. And so I'm driving it down in good and hard um, to where it's almost touching. I have about a sixteenth inch away, and I'm going to leave it right there, take it out, um, and then I can use the plane to adjust the shoulder of it to match the shoulder of the chisel. And this way I'll get a nice even fit. And I'm leaving it about that 16th inch away so it will be a final set once I actually get it all done. Um, you want that last real drive and pound down on there to be um, at the very end. And you're kind of playing a balance point of making it too tight and causing the handle to split out and making it too weak and the handle to fall out. And so it, this is a little bit more tricky. It's something you got to kind of play with. Next thing is that once I get the, the handle on there, I can draw out the octagonal shape on the end of it, the uh, oval octagonal shape. <laughs> and then we can start shaving it back down to match that shape on the end of the chisel. We can also cut it to length and get it roughly to the size we want it to be. And at this point, I could do a little more detail on it, but before actually driving the handle down on, I want to address the actual chisel itself, and it needs a lot of work. The tip on it uh, was ground down, and it is an absolute mess. So what I do is I grab a belt sander belt, um, and this is actually like a 50 degree belt, uh, 50 grit belt sander belt, and I can put it out on a piece of glass and kind of use it like a grinder. Um, I ended up, once I got it close to the shape I wanted, I moved on to a larger belt that I had, and this is uh, somewhere around 100 grit. And um, that's about as fine as I'm going to do it on this, and I'm going to use this as a grinder to grind it down. I find this actually to be a little bit faster than doing it with a, a bench grinder. Um, plus, I don't have to worry about it getting too hot. I'll still put some water on there because I don't want it to overheat, and I want to keep as much of the temper as I can. Um, but it's going to get much cooler on this, and I'm not going to have to worry about it. Now, this is going to take some time, um, but it's going to be a little bit faster than, uh, than it's going to be with the grinder. I think in total I spent about uh, 15 minutes or so, and I had to take off 
Um, a good sixteenth inch of material on the whole grind face of this, which the face of it is three quarter by inch and a half or so. Once I get it down close to it, then we can actually sharpen it, and uh, we'll start with our heart, heart, our hardest, our coarsest grit. There is the word, <laughs> and then work on from there. This is an extra, extra coarse. You can see how the the plating bubbled off on this one. Uh, I called them about that, and they sent me another one. Well, this one still works fine, so I still use that occasionally, and when it gets too bad, then I'll, I'll pull out the other one they sent me. Um, so, thanks. <laughs> so we'll go through our normal sharpening procedures, um, coarse, medium, and then extra fine, and then strop. And it is always fun working with these these big, uh, um, big beefy things. At some point here, there's a difference between do you take the stone to the work or do you take the work to the stone? This one's still um, close enough to do that. Once I get it fit on there and sharpened, I'm going to then drive the chisel down onto the body itself and get it seated well. Uh, and then we can actually shape it back. And I want to actually plane these four sides down until they're almost touching the edge of that steel shoulder um, around the, the chisel. And then we can plane the corners and plane those down until they almost touch it. The nice thing about this is the measurements are already on there. I'm just matching the shoulder um, on the chisel itself. And uh, it makes for a really nice fit and you get this um, nice um, shape on there. Of course, then we can come in and bevel the backs of it as well. Uh, use it with a plane, use it with a chisel. This one I wanted to make it a little bit bigger, so I ended up using the, the plane on there. And then, of course, we need to get them ready for finish, and so that means I'm going to use some uh, 400 grit sandpaper on here. Um, I'm just going to use this to kind of clog the pores with the dust. This will allow the boiled linseed oil to soak in a little bit farther. The dust actually will wick it a little bit farther down into it. Um, on the socket, I'm not actually going to put finish on the socket itself. I'll get it up close to that, um, but I want to leave that alone so I'm not uh, running into any issues with that. And then, of course, wipe it all off and uh, install it. And just like that, we have a finished chisel. Uh, you can see how this one's still moving on here. I haven't actually um, pounded it down on. I have that set up. Um, it's slightly out of alignment so that it lines up with the back of the chisel, um, keeping the handle out of the way. Of course, we can always take these for a test drive, and this big three-quarter inch mortising chisel is a ton of fun. <laughs> yeah, you can really wail on this and let it drive down in, and it cleans out some heavy chips very, very quickly. I, I had a lot of fun making these, and uh, yeah, uh, two different ways of making a chisel. Uh, making a handle for your own chisels is a very enjoyable thing and a lot of fun. So, there you have it. I've been wanting to do a video showing a couple different styles and methods for a long time. So I reached out to McNulty Tools, who uh, lives just a little ways north of me in Wisconsin, and said, hey, do you have any chisels that need handles? And he said, yeah, I've got a couple I'll send you. Really cool shop. He sent me uh, a couple different ones to play with. And so I had a Tang, which we could do a traditional without the ferrule, which you often see with big pig stickers or mortise chisels. And then this one, which is technically a mortise chisel, but has a socket. And I wanted to show making the socket without a lathe. You don't need a lathe as long as you just take off material where it needs to come off you can actually make them freehand I mean, it's surprisingly easy uh, you don't need the ferrule to make a good tang uh, as long as you have enough wood around it and particularly this one has a big shoulder so when you're pounding down the wood is pushing on that shoulder not splitting out the tang any farther it can't drive out any farther and that's why this one can work so I hope you like this um, I'd love to hear your thoughts on this is there anything I could do better do differently let me know that down in the comments down below I read through all of them I answer as many of the questions as I can get to and I do often learn quite a bit from that so thank you um, anytime you do put a comment down there it helps out the channel as well as hitting the like share subscribing all those things uh, really help us out so if you'd like to find out more and do even more about that there are a bunch of names over here those are all of the patrons on patreon the wonderful magnificent and benevolent people who keep this channel going without patrons or members here who've clicked the little join button down below uh, we wouldn't exist we are completely sponsored by you guys so thank you for that if you'd like to find out more about patreon there are links to that in the description or click the little join button and become a member here on youtube i think i'll do it for now and until next time have a wonderful day. Astronauts took a really interesting drink to space, but in all honesty, Tang has been around a lot longer.